Good morning. Thank you very much for this kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Welcome, everybody. As mentioned, I'll be talking about discovering and developing next-generation CRISPR-Cas tools. And it's really an honor for me to be here to represent the Doutna Lab. I did my postdoc with Jennifer Doutna um, for many years, and now went on to have my own lab, but still collaborate a lot. Very intricate uh, collaborations going on between and so I'm happy to be here today and give you sort of a, a little insight into what we've been doing in the CRISPR-Cas era. So CRISPR-Cas is really a tool for molecular biology and precision medicine. It has reshaped how we look at biomedicine and other aspects of biology in many ways. CRISPR-Cas really touches on all aspects of the drug discovery pipeline from fundamental biology to look at disease models to uncover the functions of specific single nucleotide polymorphisms to screening to disease models for safety and toxicology assessment, but also as a cellular therapy and potential therapeutic itself to treat many diseases that we face today. But where does this all come from? Really, it started with a curiosity about how bacteria fight the flu, so really a basic understanding of how some specific biology works. And while the, the sort of general belief in molecular biology is that there's a unidirectional flow of genetic information from DNA to mRNA to protein, and most currently used therapeutics still interact just at the protein level, there was a question, what if we could rewrite the genetic code itself to, de to cure or treat the underlying cause of a disease? And that's really what the discovery and development of CRISPR-Cas as a genome engineering tool enabled. And so this is work that, that was done by Jennifer Dana and many, many colleagues around the world and that has really reshaped how we understand and access and develop biology and biomedicine, but also agricultural technologies. So it is this adaptive immune system from bacteria turned tool for biomedicine that I'm gonna be talking to today about and that uh, Jennifer Dutton is also recognized here today with this prize. So again, it's an honor for me to be here and talk to you about this. As mentioned, CRISPR-Cas is an adaptive immune system in bacteria, and the name CRISPR comes from these clustered, regularly interspaced short palindromic repeats that were found in bacteria, where the spacer were found to have sequences of extra chromosomal or phage-associated origins. And so they serve as a defense mechanism as against these bacteriophages in a three-step mechanism. So we have a first adaptation step in which a phage would attack a bacteria and inject its genetic material into the bacteria. Then the bacteria takes part of this genome and integrates it into its own CRISPR loci within its genome. In second CRISPR bio biogenesis step, these parts and the CRISPR proteins are then produced and assembled into an interference complex that upon a secondary infection of a phage from the same origin can lead to a degradation of this phage and thus immunity against the phage. In the years since, we have learned much about the actual structure of these complexes, about their function, about their intricate details, how we can both understand them but also harness them as a tool for biomedicine. So here in this picture we have in white uh, spike Cas9, Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9 protein shown with, in orange, the single guide RNA that directs the protein complex to a target DNA in a sequence-specific manner. Um, shown in blue is the DNA that it interacts with and then eventually leads to double-strand DNA cleavage. Here on the left, uh, shown in a more diagrammatic way, again, we have the, the guide RNA that really enables this complex to be very modular because by simply swapping the guide, we can redirect this whole complex to any and every really specific site within the genome of pretty much any organism that we want. And then 
introduce double-strand DNA breaks at that site. The protospacer adjacent motif also gives further specificity, and in the bacteria helps to dif uh, differentiate between self and foreign so that the bacteria doesn't cut itself. When we go to mammalian cells, these double-strand breaks are often repaired by one of two main mechanisms, which are non-homologous end joining, which after the break will rejoin the two cut sites and often leads then to insertions or deletions at these sites, which allows us to introduce frame shift mutations that can lead to gene knockouts, and this is often used to exactly do that, uh, gene knockouts. On the other hand, if there is a template that's homologous on both sides of the cut, this can serve as a repair template, which allows us to introduce new information at the cut site, and through that either repair a faulty gene or introduce new information um, for, for biological studies. So this is really a very powerful tool that allows us to rewrite the genetic code in a very simple, fast forward and straightforward manner that has not been possible before. So what I want to talk about today is two aspects of how we can control CRISPR-Cas activity. Generally, the Cas proteins are always active. And so the question is, how can we further control their activity? And so there's two main themes to this. One is looking at natural evolution and systems that have evolved over time to control Cas activity. And the second is that looking at biological engineering of existing Cas or, or Cas systems that we have found and how we can use those technologies to further control the activity of Cas molecules. Just as a brief reminder, there's many, many different classes of Cas. There's one main class one and there's a class two CRISPR-Cas complexes. The important thing here to remember is that class two uh, complexes, there's a single enzyme, for example, Cas9, taking over the entire interference complex, while in the class one, this complex is composed of a multi-subunit um, entity. And so in the class two type two, we have spike Cas9 as a main example. In class two type five, we have Cas12A, also formerly known as CPF1, as a main candidate. We also have uh, class two type six, which is not shown here, um, as a ca um, Cas13 that interacts with RNA. So starting this off, um, people have now discovered many anti-CRISPRs, so these are natural proteins that can control Cas activity, and so they're thought to come from phages that want to fight against the bacteria attacking them. And um, what I'm going to talk today specifically is about the discovery of ACR 5A1, 5A4, and 5A5, uh, which were among the first uh, anti-CRISPRs of the um, Cas12A protein. And so how can we go about identifying new CRISPR or anti-CRISPR proteins in this case? Um, there's really three things that we were thinking about. We can try to identify phages that are not cleared by host CRISPR systems, and people have used that strategy. We could look at proteins that are near proteins known to be associated with CRISPR genes, or we could look for self-targeting genomes. And so the idea here is that if we have a phage attacking a bacteria and then it has a self-targeting spacer, then at the bottom it does attack the phage, but it also attacks its own genome. And so if it does that, then obviously the bacteria self-kills itself. So that's a non-viable strategy. So within this context, the bacteria sort of needs to also possess an anti-CRISPR molecule, shown here in orange, that will block the CRISPR complex so that it, in fact, it does not kill itself and can survive. So that taking this as a model, uh, Kyle Waters, a postdoc in the lab that I worked with, uh, developed a computational algorithm that allowed him to find these self-targeting genomes and then anti-CRISPR genes within this uh, the specific genomic fragments. And he looked about, through about 135,000 genomes uh, that are deposited on NCBI. Once 
some were identified, what he did is use a transcription translation system, an in vitro system, where he has both a GFP and an RFP that's being expressed, and then a CRISPR system that targets this GFP and RFP in an interference manner. And so if we use a non-targeting guide, then obviously the fluorescent protein is expressed. If we use a guide targeting the fluorophore, then the fluorophore is suppressed. But now if we also have in this context an anti-CRISPR targeting the Cas enzyme, then we see reappearance of the fluorescence. And so he used that to determine which uh, mobile genetic elements in the genomes that he identified were actually containing anti-CRISPR molecules. And there's a, there are four shown here, the ones that have both the, the orange, yellowish, and the red bars, um, showing that both uh, the GFP and RFP repression was suppressed uh, by the anti-CRISPR molecule. So he then went on to further validate them in biochemical assays, here showing just a, a cleavage of a PCR fragment. So if we have the lower band, um, then it's cleaved. And if we have an upper band, then it's un uncleaved, showing that there the anti-CRISPR provides protection. So we looked at different Cas12A um, proteins from different bacterial origins and found that they have indeed, um, some of them were functioning very well. So ACR 5A1, 5A4, and 5A5 are shown here to work in different contexts. So once we had that, uh, we obviously wanted to take this a step further and see whether we can now use these as a tool in mammalian cells and whether they would be able to inhibit the function of these Cas12A proteins also in mammalian cells. And to look at that, one thing I did here is to develop a reporter assay for Cas activity. This is very simple. We have a HEC 293 based reporter cell line that expresses a GFP fluorescent reporter that's inducible with a doxycycline controlled system. We then take this cell line called HECRT1 and introduce, using lentivirus, um, the anti-CRISPR molecule. And so the anti-CRISPR is now stably transduced in these cells and expressed from the genome of these mammalian cells. We then go in with a secondary complex, an RMP ribonucleoprotein of the Cas12 that we want to transfect and see whether it can still cut uh, the, the GFP in this context. And so after that, we, turn, we add, add doxycycline to the system to turn on the genomic uh, GFP. And so the cells that were edited, they will turn GFP positive as shown here, while the ones, sorry, the, the ones that were not edited, they turn GFP positive. The ones that were edited, they're not GFP positive. And so if we have more anti-CRISPRs, then we have protection from this uh, editing. And so when we look here, uh, we have on the left a control spike Cas9, an expression of anti-CRISPR 5A1, 5A4, 5A5, and, or BFP or MCHERRY as a control. And so none of them is able to inhibit spike Cas9, showing that there's a specificity of these anti-CRISPRs for a Cas molecule that they're sort of evolved for. In the middle, we have AS Cas12, and we see that ACR5A1 very efficiently and completely actually inhibits the function of ASCAS12, while the other two anti-CRISPR strain here do not inhibit its function. For LBCAS9, all three of these anti-CRISPRs do inhibit the function. The overall efficiency of LBCAS12 in this context wasn't that great done, so the assay is a little harder to interpret. Knowing this, really, the next big question is, what are the mechanisms of these anti-CRISPRs and how can we understand that? And so for this, another uh, very talented postdoc in Jennifer's lab uh, called Gavin Knott just recently published a paper that just came out last week um, showing uh, the mechanism of some of these anti-CRISPR molecules. And so here in the middle we have um, Cas12a targeting uh, its target, and that, that leads to immunity. Um, but if we have ACR5A4 present, the ACR5A4 molecule leads to dimerization of Cas12A, and this blocks 
double-stranded DNA access of Cas12, and so through that blocks um, the ability of this complex to edit. More interestingly, Gavin found that ACR5A1 is in fact an enzyme. So it's a multi-turnover inhibitor that cleaves the target recognition sequence of the guide RNA. So the anti-CRISPR goes in and cleaves the SG or the, 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 the CRISPR RNA uh, of Cas12A and then can do that over and over. And so this is a, the, one of the first time that, that, that an anti-CRISPR was found to be an actual enzyme and not a steric inhibitor. The, the third complex, ACR5A5, we didn't really find out yet what it was, but nicely, another paper from a different group in the same uh, journal on nature structural molecular biology came out last week, found that this one as well is in fact an enzyme, but with a different function. So ACR5A5 functions as an acetyl transferase that modifies, in this, in this case, not the guide, but in this case, it modifies Cas12 itself at the lysine 635, and this blocks the protospace adjacent motif recognition. So basically, the acetylation of Cas12 makes a steric inhibition uh, to recognize the PAM motif. And so it's really nice that these papers came out together and, and for the first time both showed that anti-CRISPRs can be enzymes with different mechanisms, one looking at blocking the guide and the other one looking at inhibiting the protein itself. With that, I want to step one step further and look at how can we involve known Cas9 molecules beyond their natural limitations. So how can we take bioengineering approaches to further evolve what we can do with Cas enzymes? So one of the limitations as mentioned before is really that Cas is always active. And so if we think about sort of future pragmatic biology, we really want to have spatial temporal control, we'd like to have tissue and cell specificity of editing and we want to potentially move beyond just cutting the genome. And so how can we achieve this? So one thing that we've developed here is circle permutation of Cas9, and I'm going to go into details of that, that then led us to be able to develop protease sensitivity of Cas9s. And this can also be used to fuse functional domains to Cas9 in a very specific and directed manner. So if we look at Cas9, spy Cas9 here from Streptococcus pyogenes, you see that the original, the natural N and C termini are one, pretty far apart from each other, and two, far apart from the single-stranded part of the DNA shown in sort of yellowish gold color here. And so this is not ideal um, for fusing protein functional domains to it. So it would be good if we could generate new NN3 prime termini that are positioned all over the topology of Cas9 so that we can fuse a functional domain of interest at the specific site where we think it's most useful. So to try to look into this, what we did is build libraries of so-called circle permutants, which is we connect the natural N and C termini together through a, a short linker and then reopen the protein at any and every other possible option throughout the entire Cas9 molecule. We built the library of these uh, circle permutants using transposon-mediated library construction and then screened them functionally. So this is a little bit about the transposon library that we built. It's really a, a enzymatic process, so we, we stochastically make all the possible options and then test them in, in this biological bacterial assay looking at uh, inhibition. So this is a crispr -I assay. And what we see is that while the library does contain uh, many variants shown at the bottom that do not work, obviously, because the circle permutation disrupted the function of Cas9, there are a good number of candidates shown at the top where, indeed, uh, the the circle permuted version seems to be still very active. So 
this diagram shows schematically, or, or even actually very specifically, where these uh, new NMC prime termini are, are placed within the topology of Cas9. So there's these red highlighted spots are the new NMC prime termini that were hit from the screen. And, and if we look at this more specifically, we see that they accumulate in three main regions within the helical two domain of Cas9 within the rough C3 domain and within the CTD. But really the important step is, can we take this again one step further into mammalian cells and do these circularly permutated Cas9 molecules still work to also cut the DNA? And so here are a few of them that are shown compared to wild type Cas9. And we see that all of them actually retain a very good amount of function, some, some 60%, but many 80 or even close to 100% activity. So this was very encouraging. So we have circular permutants that we were able to find that have rearranged NNC prime termini uh, that still function both as a DNA binding unit as well as a DNA cutting unit. One thing we saw while we were doing it, that is that when we shorten the linker between the old NNC prime terminus, eventually the protein as shown here on the left side became inactive. And so we thought, well, we might actually be able to take this as an advantage, as a tool that we can further develop by substituting this linker with a shorter linker that there is also the target site for specific protease. And so within this context, we would generate a circular or mutated Cas9 that's inactive or vigilant that has shown here in blue, a linker between the old NNC termini that is the target site for specific proteases, for example, for a flavivirus protease, and that then upon presence of this protease will get cut at that linker, releasing steric hindrance to remake an active Cas molecule. And one reason we, we chose here uh, flaviviruses because uh, they have a poly, they're, they're composed of a polyprotein where the NS2B, NS3 protease uh, has to cut at the, uh, at the side shown here with uh, red triangles, and that's part of the viral uh, life cycle. And so taking this protease would allow us to have a Cas9 that responds to the presence of such a pathogen. Um, yeah, I already talked about this. And, and so with, within the bigger context, this allows us to, to develop the concept of regulatable Cas9 enzymes that really can respond to potentially any protease shown in their microenvironment within a cell, within a specific tissue or specific cell type. So we first started to test this concept again in bacteria uh, with two types of proteases shown on the left uh, we have plant proteviruses, which are one of the biggest pathogens in plants and agricultural um, problems. And on the right, uh, for the group of flaviviruses, including Zika, West Nile virus, dengue, yellow fever. And so as we can see, if we have a matching protease and a protease target sites, we were able to, at least in some of these cases, build very specifically inducible systems. They're not compatible across each other because they, they recognize very different sites. But within, for example, the group of the flavivirus, the Zika virus somewhat recognizes the target site of the West Nile virus shown here because they normally recognize similar target protease sites. Again, we wanted then to take this a step further into mammalian cells and developed, again, a uh, reporter assay in mammalian cells as before. Um, this is, again, a HEC-based cell line in this instance containing the ProCas9. So we, we, we named these circular permutant Cas9s with the protease activation sites ProCas9s. Um, that they're stably integrated within the genome of these cells, and then either in the absence of a protease, we can look for leakiness, potential leakiness of the system, as shown at the top here, 
or in the presence of a flavivirus protease, we can see whether the, uh, whether the um, ProCas9 gets activated and then leads to its programmed DNA double strand breaks. So this is looking at the leakiness of the system. We can see on the left side, we have a wild type Cas9 that very efficiently cuts Cas9 here to about 85%, both after six and 10 days of exposure, while all the different pro-Cas9 variants that we developed here do not show any significant DNA cleavage. So this shows we can basically build, and this is sort of the interesting point here, a single molecule sensor effector that can be genetically encoded within the context of a mammalian cell to detect viral presence and then also potentially record that and use it as a defense mechanism against it. And uh, focusing here with this example on flaviviruses and the NS2B, NS3 protease. So now we have the same cells um, that either express uh, a de deactivated tobacco edge virus protease or the Zika virus protease, NS2B, NS3 protease, or the West Nile virus protease. And we can see both of these flaviviral proteases are able to activate the system while the DTEF did not activate the system. If we expose these cells to a longer time point of editing, so in this case, four and eight days, uh, we see that this editing efficiency and induction actually goes up uh, to, to a good number of uh, 35 to 40% for the more active uh, system. Mechanistically, how does this work? So we want to understand this a little further. So the idea is that we have a virginal ProCas9 that's sterically hindered by the linker shown here in blue, and the protease then cuts this into a two-subunit Cas complex uh, that, that still needs to hold together to uh, lead to genome editing. So by Western blood, we were able to show that we have the about 160 kilo Dalton band that is expected for spy Cas9 in the absence of the uh, matching protease, but when we have the matching protease shown in the last lane, we see the bigger subunit of this complex here by Western blotting. If we use an antibody that recognizes the smaller subunit, respectively, we see that uh, the smaller subunit comes up only when, again, the right protease is present. Also nicely, the majority of this complex is actually cut um, in the presence of the protease. So the, 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 the activation seems to be very active at this protein level. Going one step further, we then wanted to see what can we do with the system. Can we use the DNA, uh, the uh, sgRNA guided uh, step to actually do something useful towards uh, an altruistic defense system? And so here, what we look at is hex cells and have one cell line, a uh, haploid cell line, um, expressing different sgRNAs. And so in this, uh, these, the ones shown here, are sgRNAs targeting an olfactory receptor as a negative control. So if we target an olfactory receptor, it's a non-essential gene, we expect no effect. And indeed, over time, we see the fraction of cells that are uh, mCherry positive here for containing the sgRNA, and they remain more or less the same. However, if we target an essential gene such as RPA1, that's the replication protein A1, which is part of the replication machinery, so it's needed for cells to survive, then we see that over time, um, these cells will deplete. And so, this, so far, this is all shown with the wild type Cas9. And if we take an sgRNA that we call SG side here that targets a, a highly amplified locus, we can show that indeed the cells do not survive because their genomes get uh, fragmented. When we do the same thing with our ProCas9, in the absence of a protease, none of these has any effects, more or less. There's, there's basically no depletion of these cells over time, showing again that the system is nice and not leaky, and, and thus the cells can tolerate the presence of these guides uh, if it's not activated. So next question now, obviously, if we, in this context, introduce a protease that activates Cas9, do we see depletion? And in fact, we do. So again, only on the right side, if we have both 
uh, the proper guide and the activation with the proper protease, we see activation of the system. And then in this context, depletion of uh, protease positive cells. So wrapping this up, we, really what we did show here is that we can reprogram Cas enzymes by circular permutation. And this allows us to generate circular permutated Cas9s that have redistributed NNC termini all over the topology of Cas9. This allows us to then take this and build a pro-Cas9 enzyme which is inactive unless it encounters the protease that it is made uh, to sense. And then this protease will cleave the linker, releasing that steric hindrance and making it an active Cas complex. And we can imagine in the future using this for cell autonomous effectors, potentially molecular recording, and other, other cell and tissue specific activation of Cas9. So for example, if, if you want to deliver Cas9 uh, to a specific tissue, but your delivery vehicle might also bring it into tissues around it, this could serve to only then have Cas9 be activated in the cells of interest. On the other hand, these cellular uh, circle permutant Cas9s can also be used as a scaffold for very precise modular fusion proteins. And so these, uh, for example, can be used in the context of DNA modifying enzymes or epigenetic modifiers. So this can be, go beyond um, DNA cutting. And one application that really comes to mind here is base editors. So base editors um, is really something that's been pioneered by David Lu's lab. And what they do is basically fuse a, a nickase Cas9 to a deaminase. So we have uh, the C base editors where a cytidine deaminase is fused through a linker to Cas9 and then brings the, dia the Cas9 brings the deaminase to a specific location in the DNA. The DNA is nicked, so only one strand is cut. And then at that site, uh, the deaminase will convert a uh, specific base. And this can be used to edit or base edit DNA without the need for double strand breaks, which can have potential advantages in uh, preventing um, damage to the cells. They have also developed the same concept for adenine base editors, where again, um, the Cas molecule brings uh, adenine deaminase to the DNA. Because uh, the adenine deaminase are not present in nature for DNA, they had to evolve a RNA deaminase, adenine deaminase into a DNA deaminase. So this was a little more tricky, but um, eventually it worked. But so what we were wondering, um, and we worked together with them on this, is whether we could use our circular permutants to ba build new base editors where the fusion of the deaminase wouldn't just be through a very long linker at the N and C termini that are naturally present, but whether we could fuse these deaminases at one of the new N and C prime termini that we were able to generate through the circular permutation, and whether that would then allow us to build uh, base editors that are have different properties. And while this is um, still unpublished, um, I don't want to go too much into details, but we were able to build new uh, both C base editors and ABEs uh, based on the circle permutant scaffolds. And they do, in fact, allow us to shift the window of deamination that we see within these complexes. And through that, this allows us to access more of the clinically, uh, clinically relevant uh, single nuclei polymorphisms um, that were otherwise not accessible because the PAM sequence might otherwise have been too far away from the SNP that you wanted to target. So again, as a summary, we built these uh, circle permutants and they can be used for, both for tissue specific editing but also as a platform for very specific um, generation of new 
modular fusion proteins. And in general, this allows us to overcome the limitation that we find of the Cas molecules in nature. So obviously, nature evolved the Cas molecules to address the need that they have, which is uh, innate immune system for bacteria. So simply cutting uh, the phage DNA was sufficient because the phage cannot repair that. But in mammalian system, because we have a more complex double strand DNA repair uh, pathway, you know, other functions might be needed. Um, And so with that, I'd like to uh, thank everybody that uh, was involved in this work, especially Jennifer Dana, who gave me an opportunity to uh, do my postdoc with her. That was a tremendous opportunity. She's really a great uh, person to learn from and to work with. And everybody in her lab, uh, people that were involved in these projects that I've shown here today, Cal Waters, who's, who was a postdoc in her lab as well, Sean Wren, who worked with me, who was a undergrad and then RA. Gavin Knott, who's another postdoc in Jennifer's lab who worked on the mechanism. Uh, Marco Loba, Mehek, um, many other people. As well as collaborator from David, Dave Savage's lab who, with whom we worked on the uh, CP Cas9 and Pro Cas9 story. And Ben Oaks uh, from that lab who took the lead on that story with me and um, then obviously funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>